we're being recorded tonight, so I need to have on the record that nothing I say tonight is representative of any of the organisations mentioned, um, just my own data and opinions. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, yeah, I hope that you're all interested and want to uh, be engaged in the process of trying to get better nature laws for Australia. I'm going to try and convince you, along with the other evidence produced tonight, that the nature laws have some room for improvement uh, and maybe a few avenues for that improvement and happy to uh, talk to you for hours about the details of that. And I promise I'm going to bring you something new tonight. So if you've heard me talk about Black Road Finch and if you've ever met me before, I'm sure you've heard me talk about Black Road Finch, I have some new material. Okay, there it is. Isn't it gorgeous? Beautiful bird. Okay, just to recap, the black throat finch used to occur throughout a whole lot of Queensland and into New South Wales, but it hasn't been seen through most of that range for quite a long time. And in fact, when we've reconstructed where we believe their full extent once was compared to where it is now, we estimate that it's probably lost about 88% of that original extent. So there's a much smaller range now than what there would have been. And a lot of that northern New South Wales, southeast Queensland range would have been lost a very long time ago. So just land use change through mostly agriculture, just some of it actual broad scale clearing of the habitat, but a lot of it would have just been um, slow degradation until there just wasn't enough food left we we think that that's probably what happened you know a long time ago 100 years ago or more uh, and those same pressures are still present today where the habitat's being lost but also just degraded through use and there is essentially no black throat finch habitat that we know of that sits within a protected area that hasn't ever been logged or grazed or impacted it just all of it has been impacted at some point and even now almost none of it sits on any kind of protected area. So it's all kind of vulnerable. So the black throat finch um, was listed under the EPBC Act when the Act first came in. Or right, off the, um, right from the start, it was listed as vulnerable. And so there's, there's multiple um, categories of listing for species and threatened ecological communities. Communities, one of which is vulnerable so we're saying it is vulnerable to extinction but you know this is not a, a severe threat just yet when that threat escalates it becomes endangered and then as that threat continues to um, accelerate it's a critically endangered and then when there's really none left presumed extinct and then when we can verify extinct so straight away as soon as the act came in uh, it was realized that the black throat finch was um, fitting that criteria of vulnerable. And then it was only five years later that it was realized that it actually fit the criteria for endangered and was uplisted to that more severe category. So it got a recovery plan written. Okay, well, we better do something about this. Let's write a plan. So it's lost quite a lot of habitat. It has been recognized that it's been threatened right from the start of the act. And it does have a recovery team, a group of people that in theory are going to help work out how to recover the black throat finch. It even has a plan, but it's a bit hard to do anything with a plan when there's no funding. And yet the habitat is still being cleared despite all of these things in place, listing, a team, a plan, all this recognition. And so this species obviously has had quite a bit of press. It's a bird people tend to like birds. Imagine if you're a threatened grass or something that people don't tend to get as excited about. I like grasses, but you know, um, you know, imagine what um, clearing is probably happening out there that we're not even hearing about. It's probably going to be getting a lot less scrutiny. And the black throat finch isn't alone in being a species that has been listed as vulnerable and then uplisted to a more severe category. And in fact, there are four times more species that have gone from vulnerable to a more severe listing category than the reverse. And I think even the species that have been downlisted are usually the ones where they've just got more information, discovered there's more populations than we thought. So 
Australia really doesn't have a very good record of realizing that something is threatened and then doing something about it and bringing it back. And there's a paper that a colleague of ours here at EQ has just recently published and we can make that available for people that want to look at that data. But basically, when species get listed as vulnerable, not really that much happens. Not a whole lot happens when they get listed as endangered and critically endangered, but a lot more than what happens if they're listed as vulnerable. And so one of the recommendations that we want to make about improving the act is when we recognize a species is vulnerable to extinction, stop clearing their habitat. Like we actually need to do something about that or they're just going to keep going on that trajectory to extinction. So back to the black throated finch, um, just like Michelle, I was looking at what clearing of the black throated finch habitat was referred under federal government. Um, this is how much habitat we believe existed for black throated finch when the act was in force. So the EPBC Act, EPBC Act 1999 started to be enacted in the year 2000. And there are about 775 referrals that have happened since the act began that overlapped with potential black throat finch habitat. And there were some that were refused by the minister at the time. Uh, the minister actually said, no, that's clearly unacceptable impact to the, well, in one case, the black throat finch, and that was a housing development near Townsville. But all of the other referrals were approved and more than half of those were approved with no conditions. Yes, go ahead, clear black throat finch habitat, no worries. Some of those, the ones in the blue bars, were controlled actions, which means there was a bit more oversight and some of those did have conditions for black throat finch, which I'll go into. And then just as Michelle found, there's a whole bunch of clearing that sat outside referrals so most well a whole lot of that clearing isn't having oversight by the federal government uh, and that is again is a major flaw in the act we're losing species that the federal government is recognizing as threatened with extinction and yet they're not regulating that habitat loss even when they are regulating it it still ends up with habitat loss Okay, that's the spot that's been in the press a whole lot. Uh, and that's the site of a whole bunch of proposed thermal coal mines in the Galilee Basin, which just happens to be the largest population remaining of the Southern Black Road Finch. And it's a really amazing habitat. And if you ever get the opportunity to go out there, um, you know, do go out there and check out the black throat finches because you will never see flocks of black throat finches of that size anywhere else in the world. And it's really amazing. There are five thermal coal mines that have received approval from both the state and the federal government to clear black throated finch habitat. Um, there's a list there, but there's a whole bunch more that is still going through that process, including Alpha North, which would be double the size of a Danese Carmichael coal mine. Now, because there is so little black throated finch habitat remaining, there are now when really high quality black throated finch habitat is being approved to clear, then associated with that for most of these cases are environmental offsets. So the condition is you want to clear this habitat, you now must put in place an offset. Now, I'd just like to um, touch on offsets and why this is not going to ameliorate the impact. And just a general uh, statement about offsets. There was uh, a global study that's recently published that looked at all of the offsets in the whole world that were documented for uh, biodiversity. Very few of them actually examined whether you could actually ameliorate that impact. So the way that that's usually measured is was there a net loss in biodiversity. So if you started off with five finches and then you did your habitat impact, your mine or whatever it was, do we end up with five finches at the end of the day? Very few actually measure how effective the offsets uh, and process was. And in fact, only 2% of all of the offsets in the world, 2% by area actually measured the outcomes. 
And the ones that are doing the more detailed control before, after control impact type studies are all happening in high income countries with strong governance, strong institutions. So um, this is not just happening in parts of the world that we think of when we think of as, you know, relative high corruption and low governance. This is happening in strong um, countries with strong institutions and strong governance. There was no offset that they could find in the world in a terrestrial ecosystem that achieved no net loss. So start off with your five finches, have your impact, have your offset, and still have five finches at in, in the end of the day. Now, it's really hard to measure those things. So maybe there's one of those projects out there managed it, just was unable to demonstrate it. It's hard to measure, but it's also really hard to do. One of the other problems with the offset is that it's a bit like saying to somebody, you know, you can, you can have the best of both worlds. You can go ahead with your development and you can have an offset and save biodiversity. Everybody wins and everyone loves a compromise or a win-win situation. This is something that, you know, when they've done psychological research, people respond to really strongly. Um, they, you know, people like to see themselves as balanced and, and have, you know, a, a solution that everyone gets an outcome. And so what it does is it delivers this false promise. You can have your development and you can have biodiversity. We have a solution. And so then people are less willing to say, no, you can't have that development. Or as we say, another step in the mitigation hierarchy, just avoid the impact, just don't have the impact in the first place or to mitigate that impact. So it's avoid, mitigate, offset. People don't even worry about avoid and mitigate. They just go straight to offset because it's available. If we're going to have offsets as part of that policy toolbox, we need to have a very honest assessment about what they can actually do and what it would actually mean to create an offset that would give you a no net loss outcome. Thankfully, we have a little bit of research on black throat finch um, offsets in Australia. Courtney Melton, thank you very much for your hard work. This is a horrible project. I'm so sorry, Courtney. There is no offsets register for um, EPBC Act offsets. So poor Courtney, it took her months to even find out where the offset was, who was managing it, which project the offset related to, like we don't have that information. So even just tracking down the information of who, where, what, how much, how do I access it, it was a nightmare. And when this information was finally uh, tracked down and gathered, uh, Courtney found that most of those offsets were full of weeds. And so Habitat degradation is a really big problem for black throat finch. It happens with grazing and the weeds that are often associated with grazing. And all the offsets are full of weeds. So we've got black throat finch offsets and they're currently not working. What would it actually take to create a no net loss black throat finch offset? If we're going to actually destroy some critical habitat here, how would we not end up with a net loss? Well, you'd actually have to take some habitat that might have been degraded by cows or um, unsustainable fire regimes and weeds and then recreate good, happy, wonderful black throated finch habitat of enough scale to support a population. In some of the work that's coming out of CSIRO up in North Queensland, they're finding once you destock an area, that ground layer of grass seeds that the finches rely on doesn't come back for 30 years. Like this is a very long time to establish uh, the food for black throat finches. Getting rid of weeds is a really big job. I don't know if anyone goes out there with a, you know, backhoe or whatever. I love weeding. It's one of the funnest things ever, but it's hard work and it takes a long time. It's a really big job to recreate habitat. It's going to take decades and it may not work. So if you do want to create a no net loss offset, start now. Start planning for the next 30, 40, 50 years in advance and hopefully, you know, you might be able to do that. It's probably possible. Adani have an offset plan for their Carmichael um, coal and rail project. 
They've been given permission to clear seven, over 7,000 hectares of black throat finch habitat for the mine and 778 hectares for the railway. 6,000 hectares of that was identified as, by their words, critical habitat, and they must offset 20,000 hectares. Now, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Revel, but it was a four year window that they have. So they're allowed to go out there and start clearing black throat finch habitat. They don't even have to secure the offset for four years after starting that impact. So they're not starting 30 years before the impact. They don't even have to secure it until within four years of having started that impact. Habitat degradation is the second biggest threat to black throat finches. The first one is clearing the habitat. The second one is degradation of the habitat. Adani state in their offset plan, they're going to graze the black throat finch offset. So they're not starting 30 years in advance and restoring this habitat. They're gonna start in the few years after clearing, they've already started clearing out there. And then they're going to graze it. And then cows eat grass, finches need to eat the grass seeds. There's not a lot of food when the, the cows are out there. I really like this quote um, by the independent review panel who looked at Adani's plan. Uh, and they said and published in a conversation article the day that the Queensland government approved the Adani's um, Black Throat Finch Management Plan. There is no excuse for such a poor plan to have been put forward for approval when the company, Adani, has been aware for almost a decade that the land it wants to mine is home to the largest known remaining population of the Black Throat Finch. And Adani's uh, environment officer told me um, back, I believe, in 2013, Gautam Adani knows about the black throat finch and, and really cares and wants to make sure we protect it. So, you know, if they've known for a long time they're out there, their plan isn't the kind of plan that's going to ameliorate the impact of the world's largest population of black throat finch. So what does that mean for the EPBC Act? Well, number one, we need to get out there and we need to map the critical habitat of all of our threatened species because we don't actually have that map for most things. And in fact, there is a register under the EPBC Act of critical habitat. And I believe there's three species, four species. So we have 1,700 threatened species listed under the EPBC Act. And there's, I think, three or four with their critical habitat listed on the register. So. There's a bit of work to do. We can go out there, let's map it, let's register it. Once we've done that, then we need to say, this is not available. So some of the terms people are using are um, no-go zones, just no, sorry, you can't go and mine that habitat or farm it or whatever. The second recommendation for the EPBC Act is evaluating those impacts in that whole context. And that's been brought up a few times uh, here. What are the cumulative impacts? Not just that mine and that housing development and that sugarcane farm, but actually all of those impacts at once. Uh, how much of that habitat is left and how much of the habitat is going to be taken up by all of those proposed projects? If you want to use offsets, maybe they might be appropriate sometimes, but we need to know really what offsets can deliver and if you want to have a known net loss offset, you need to demonstrate that it's working before you're allowed to go ahead with that impact. That's the only way. I mean, it's really hard to do habitat restoration. It's expensive, it takes a very long time, it often doesn't work. Then you get a catastrophic wildfire and it all burns. Then you get a flood. It's, it's just hard work, it takes a long time. You need to actually show that it's working if you want to have a known net loss. Um, outcome. And then finally, we want to have greater transparency around the decisions that are being made. So what are the conditions for all of those projects? How are they set? Are they science-based? Are the offsets working? Where are they? Who are managing them? How are they being managed? You know, just make this information transparent, available, and so that we can have that scrutiny as the public, as interested people. 
and all the other recommendations that are obviously being made tonight. Thank you very much.